the European powers. And so they figure, why don't we follow their pattern and take their resources, take that from others. You know, why don't we industrialize? So let's talk about what's been going on in China. China had a revolution. So Sun Yat-sen is a Chinese nationalist revolutionary and the founder of the Guomindang until his death. So he's going to attempt to create a liberal democratic movement in China. But he is going to be thwarted primarily by military leaders. So Sun Yat-sen is going to be born into a modest rural household. He'll study medicine in Hong Kong, which is controlled by the British. He will have lived internationally, spending time in Japan, the UK, and the US. And he has a forceful personality and grand ambitions. So he's going to seek to try and mix nationalism, socialism, and Confucian philosophy, particularly Han nationalism. So he's going to really criticize Qing Manchu rule. So remember, China is full of all of these ethnic diversities, and they influence its internal politics as well. So he will lead the Republican Revolution and will eventually be elected president of the Republic of China. This is a very short-lived republic. Let's talk about it. So, in 1911, Sun Yat-sen will lead the Republican Revolution and be elected president, right? So this ends the Qing Dynasty. Here's the thing. You have all of these revolution, sorry, regional warlords, right? So China is huge and they have millions of people. So it's easy to take control of just, you know, one city, but it's harder to hold it. So you have these regional warlords and they don't want to be ruled by anyone else. They want to just do their own thing. So he tries to propose the five races under one union flag. It's going to represent the harmony of the five major ethnic groups. The Han are represented by the um, red, Manchus by the yellow, Mongols by the blue, Hui, which are the Muslim Chinese, by the white, and the Tibetans by the black. Sun is never really going to be comfortable with a multiracial flag. He is kind of a racist, right? So he believes there should only be one Chinese race, and that's the Han. In 1912, Hui, the last Qing empire, will abdicate. And this will lead um, to a bunch of changes. One, a military strongman named Wang, Yuan um, Shikai will force Sun Yat-sen to concede the presidency to him. So Sun then forms the Guomindang, Yuan dismisses all efforts to further democracy and will dissolve this brand new parliament. So it's only after Yuan's death that Sun takes charge again. So you can see revolution, military rule under Yuan, and then the Guomindang rule under Sun Yat-sen. So in 1919, at the Treaty of Versailles, Japan wants the German spheres of influence in China. China thinks that it should go back to them because, you know, it's their territory. And China was an ally of the Entente as well. They sent thousands of workers to the United States and to Western Europe to fill those factory jobs emptied by the soldiers. They wanted their territory back. And Europe will give that territory to Japan, not China, which is really going to upset China. Understandably, right? <clears throat> All right, in 1919, thus we see the May 4th movement. Not like May the 4th be with you. This is not like a precursor to Star Wars. But it's resistance to Jap Japanese encroachments in China from the Treaty of Versailles. So thousands of Chinese students who studied in Beijing universities will protest, will demonstrate. This will trigger actually widespread agitation and the protests will begin to spread to other cities as well. Slowly, merchants and workers will join the protest, and there's even going to be a boycott of Japanese goods. 
So they are upset about how European powers are still making choices without their consent and doing it to the detriment of their own country. So your goals of the May 4th movement is to try and create a liberal democracy in China, um, a stronger military to eject the imperial powers that are occupied along the coastlines, and to institute liberal reforms. That's suffrage, free speech, just think Bill of Rights stuff. This is a total failure, right? It's completely ineffective against the powerful warlords. So let's talk about these a little bit. The Chinese warlords and the Guomindang. So the Guomindang will seize power in 1916, like I said, originally organized by Sun Yat-sen. But in 1925, um, Sun Yat-sen dies. And so Chiang Kai-shek will take charge. Chiang Kai-shek is a military and political leader. He's much more aggressive than Sun Yat-sen. He will fight against the Chinese communists and the Japanese invaders. And after 1949, he will lead the Chinese nationalist government in Taiwan. So Chiang Kai-shek is going to be kind of like the man to know for, gosh, the next 30 years. He's a really interesting guy. Um, his wife is fascinating. So his wife, um, known as like Madam Cheng, is going to be American educated. So like when she was 10, she was brought over to the United States and she was raised in Georgia. So she spoke English fluently with a Southern accent. She really viewed herself like as a Southerner. Her brother will... Um, remain in the United States, but he spent more of his time in Boston, eventually going to Ivy League schools there. And so he has more of a Boston accent. Um, fun fact, my great grandmother went to college with Madame Chang. So there's my connection to history. So the Nationalist Party, the Guomindang, under Chiang Kai-shek is going to be the biggest rival for communism. So we're going to see in the 1940s and 50s, we're going to have a civil war between the nationalists and the communists. So how did they do? Right? How did the Guomindang do? Well, early accomplishments. Here are the pros. They crushed the warlords. But they established a dictatorship, right? So Chiang Kai-shek isn't really as interested in like these liberal reforms that the May 4th movement was interested in. Right? He's a nationalist. He's not a Democrat. He's not necessarily a liberal. right? Um, so remember, nationalism is all about sort of rule for the country. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean democracy. It can mean authoritarian rule versus communism, which again might be authoritarian rule, but the difference here is economic systems primarily. So early accomplishments of the nationalists of the Guomindang, you're going to see they crush the warlords, they establish a dictatorship, and they will sponsor mass organizations of worker labor unions, peasant leagues, women's associations. But they are more focused on political issues, and they're ignoring the issues important to the peasants, things like, I don't know, a famine, the lack of primary education, domestic programs to help them. It doesn't help that all of the administrators in the Guomindang are incompetent or corrupt, right? So communism is going to be much more appealing to the masses than nationalism. So here's the, going to be the tension. The poor are going to side with the communists. The rich, those in power, those who, for whom the status quo benefits, they are going to really be supporting the um, Guomindang. So let's talk about communism in a moment. Li Dezhao is going to be a Chinese intellectual, and he's going to really rework Marxist ideology to fit China. So it's interesting here to pause and think about Marxism, right? Because Marxism has not yet been adopted wholeheartedly by anyone, right? Our two largest communist states 
ever in world history are going to be the Soviet Union and China. And yet neither of them are truly communist. Neither of them are actually following Marx's ideas. First of all, Marx develops ideas for Europe. His ideas are not actually applicable with countries that have a massive rural population. Second of all, like I've said a million times now, Marxism relies on everyone being intrinsically self-sacrificing, right? It's all about I'm going to always, always, every single time make the choice that will help others even if it hurts me. Now, most of us are pretty good about doing that some of the time, maybe even most of the time. But come on, you know there's sometimes a choice where it's you break a cookie in half, you could give the bigger piece to your sibling or keep it yourself. You keep it yourself, right? You are unable to consistently, every single time, sacrifice. Especially when the sacrifices are things like we are asking that your children go hungry so other people's children can be fed. Well, what about my kids? They're hungry. Or choices that ask you to go without a roof over your head or to risk your life, right? It's easy to be like, yeah, I have a lot. I'm happy to give up a little. But when you have very little and you're asked to give that up as well, ooh, that's hard. So in China, Li Dezhou is going to be, um, and once again, I apologize for my pronunciation, um, going to be reworking Marxist ideology to fit China. He's convinced that China's small urban working class is unable to carry out the revolution by itself. So this is very similar, right? Very similar to Lenin. Lenin recognized that the small urban working class in Russia would be unable to carry out the revolution. So because of this, Li is going to disregard or downplay the doctrine of the proletarian class struggle presented in Marxism and Leninism, right? So here's a big difference between Chinese communism versus Russian or European communism. Lenin is all about class struggle, right? It's all about the proletariat versus the bourgeoisie, the poor versus the rich. Well, in part, think about Russia, right? You had all these poor and then you had these super elite rich people with the czars. In China, it's not really like that. Um, you don't really have such a clear class system. So that's not a useful um, dynamic. Instead, what Li is going to do, he's going to alter Marx's two-class system by extending it to a two-region system. The bourgeoisie, aka the oppressive West, versus the proletariat China. So it's not the poor Russians versus the rich Russians. It's China versus the West. He believes in social reform, an authoritarian state, to intervene constructively in people's lives and social welfare. So in 1921, the Communist China, sorry, the Communist Party of China will be created. Young Mao Zedong is a member and he's influential in attracting followers. It's Li's ideas though that will form the core of Mao's thinking. So let's take a moment to look at uh, sort of economic things, particularly in China. So in Europe, our early modern European classes, remember, we had like the first estate in France, the church, second estate, royalty and aristocracy, third estate, bourgeoisie, and peasants. Then in Europe, right, we go to, um, or sorry, here's the issue. Let me start all over again. I apologize for this, guy. So early modern Europe, three estates. Um, then they are going to go to a post-industrial state, right? Bourgeoisie and proletariat. But China hasn't industrialized. So you are still kind of here, right, with the peasants and the aristocracy. You're not going to go to here. Right? China doesn't industrialize, so it doesn't get here. So instead, China sets it up as the bourgeoisie is the West and the proletariat is all of China. So the end goal for both of these is a classless society. Right? 
um, in European states, we saw socialist revolutions, um, like in Russia. So no private property, equity of resources and production. That's the goal of a post-socialist society. Li Dizhou claims that China can have a proletarian revolution without all the peasants being involved, right? We can just rise up and get the Western influence out. So I recommend that after this video, you go and you watch the crash course on the Chinese revolutions. It will really help you understand it. But for now, I want you to pause the video and ask yourself, can I identify and explain the strengths and weaknesses of the Chinese Republic? So this is a little self-assessment. Pause and think about it a little bit. We'll be continuing to talk about what's happening in Japan um, and China um, in a little bit once we talk about what's going on with the Great Depression in the 1920s and the rise of fascism. Then we'll go back over to Japan and its imperial ambitions. But strengths and weaknesses of the Chinese Republic. Strengths are going to be strong military, right? Authoritarian rule. They are going to um, sponsor some worker unions, peasant leagues. Weaknesses, super corrupt. Um, unable to fully fight back the, um, against the warlords. In 1924, in fact, um, Chiang Kai-shek is going to open up a military academy, and the U.S. will supply the weaponry, whereas in 19, um, whereas the communists are going to be much more figuring things out on their own. Eventually, they will get support from the USSR. Okay, so here's another pause self-assessment. Um, if you were going to get this prompt as an LEQ, what would you write as a thesis statement? So. I recommend you pause the video and you write a thesis statement for this prompt. Analyze similarities and differences in the role of the state in Japan's economic development and the role of the state in the economic development um, of one of the following, China, the Ottomans, or Russia. So you're being asked to compare Japan and China, the Ottomans, and Russia. But here's the key thing. It's not just how are they similar and different. It's not even how are their economies similar and different. It's how did the role of the state, how did the role of government differ or are similar for in Japan versus one of these other states. So here's a thing we see a lot of times with um, essays. Students will write excellent essays, fantastic essays that don't answer the prompt. So here would be like something I've seen before. Students just comparing Japan and China. What are similarities, what are differences? Right, well you got some of the prompt here. You picked one of the states and you are analyzing similarities and differences, but you aren't analyzing the role of the state in economic development. Here's another place where I see students get close but not quite right. They analyze the economic development in, of Japan compared with that of like Russia, right? Again, how is their economic development similarity and similar or different? How do they industrialize? How are they similar or different? Again, you're close, but unless you are explicitly talking about the role of the state, the role of government, you cannot get the points on the rubric because all of the points on the rubric include a line that says that answers the prompt. Write a thesis. Um, students write an acceptable thesis in response to the prompt. It's not just enough to write a good thesis. It's not just enough to write a good essay. You must be sure you're answering the prompt. Okay, let's talk about the L Middle East a little bit to finish off our day. So, the new Middle East. If you remember, during World War I, Europe said, hey, if you help us out, if you fight against the Ottomans, we will give you independence, right? Well, that's not gonna happen. Instead of being given their independence, former German colonies and Ottoman territories will be given to the great powers as mandates. So what are mandates? Well, it, this is gonna be something that comes out of um, the League of Nations 
Woodrow Wilson wants self-determination. He wants all of these states to become independent. Europe wants imperialism, right? They just want all these states to become colonies. The mandate system is a compromise between the two. So there are going to be three levels, and some of them will be root, um, these different levels will have different amounts of independence. So class C colonies will be ruled as, sorry, class C mandates will be ruled as colonies, right? These are often the smallest populations, most isolated places like Namibia. Class B mandates were to be ruled under League of Nations supervision. So they're larger than a class C, but still underdeveloped. And they're going to be ruled under the League of Nations for the benefit of their inhabitants. If you can't hear the quotation marks between that, uh, around that phrase, um, insert them there. So for the benefit of their inhabitants. Well, wasn't that always the line in colonization anyway? We're doing this for the good of the Africans, for the good of the Indians. Yeah, okay. You're doing it for the good of your pocketbook, Europe. So this would be like Tanganyika, Cameroon, Togo. Finally, Class A mandates were typically the Arab-speaking territories of the former Ottoman Empire. So here's what the line says. Out, straight out of the League of Nations, you know, paperwork. Class A mandates have reached a stage of development where their existence as independent nations can be provisionally recognized, subject to the rendering of administrative advice and assistance by a mandatory until such a time as they are able to stand alone. The wishes of these communities must be a principal consideration in the selection of the mandatory. That makes no sense, right? This is very ambiguous. It is intended to be ambiguous to make these Arab territories feel like they're independent, but in reality, they're not. It's defined to lead Arabs to believe that they have their promised independence, but in practice, Britain takes control of Palestine, Iraq, Transjordan, while France takes control of Syria, Lebanon, and North Africa, right? So they're really not independent. So let's look at a couple maps here. So um, in 1916, with the collapse of the Ottomans, right, you have the Sykes-Picot Agreement, and you will see how the... Um, territory is divided up under the influence of European states, right? Enter Woodrow Wilson, and he's like, no, 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 colonization's bad. And so we have the mandates instead, right? So you can see here Syria, Lebanon, Palestine, Transjordan, Iraq. Saudi Arabia is allowed to be independent um, because who wants the desert? Um, also, they agreed to give us oil. But look, these are basically the same, right? It's British, British. International slash British, British. French, French, right? So cool. It's a new name, but same system. All right, but what about Turkey? Turkey wasn't on either of those maps. So at the end of the war, the Ottoman Empire is at the point of collapse. French, British, Italian, Greek forces all occupy Constantinople and Istanbul and parts of the Anatolian Peninsula, right? So that's, that's the body of Turkey is the Anatolian Peninsula. So in 1919, Mustafa Kemal is going to form a nationalist government. He will reconquer the Anatolian Peninsula in the area around Constantinople in 1922. So he becomes known as Ataturk. He is a founder of modern Turkey, and he is an outspoken modernizer who declared Turkey to be a secular republic. So you got to know about Ataturk. So he is going to try and make Turkey a, um, a modern state like European Western states are. So what does he do? Well, he 
says that Europe or um, Turkey is going to be a secular republic. This is different from the Ottomans, right, who were ruled by Sharia law. He's going to institute a Western calendar, aka the Christian calendar, um, the Gregorian calendar, in opposition to the Muslim calendar. He will replace the Arabic alphabet with the Latin alphabet. So that's why Turkish actually uses sort of the same set of letters as um, English and French, as opposed to um, the Arabic alphabet, which is used obviously in Arabic and like Farsi. He's going to try and westernize the Turkish family, the role of women, even Turkish clothing and headgear. So no more polygamy. Um, he wants everyone to take sort of a Western style last name, like Ataturk. So he's going to um, replace the Ottoman Empire with the Turkish Republic. His reforms are going to spread quickly in urban areas, but they are going to impact, encounter a lot of resistance in the countryside where Muslim traditions will remain strong. All right, what about the rest of um, sort of our Muslim territories? Well, the mandate system is going to be very unpopular. Turns out that the people living in these areas can tell that it's thinly disguised colonialism. So this sets off protests and rebellions. We see that the Middle East um, undergoes significant changes. The population grows by 50% between 1914 and 1939. Major cities will double in size. And the urban merchant class will adopt Western ideas, customs, and lifestyles. So the Maghreb, um, you can see this territory here in Northern Africa. Algeria, Tunisia, Morocco will be dominated by the French army and by French settlers who owned the best lands and monopolized government jobs and business. So Arabs and ethnic Berbers will remain poor and suffer from discrimination. What about in Iraq and Egypt? Well, the British will allow Iraq to become independent under King Faisal, the leader of the Arab revolt, and the um, guy that Lawrence of Arabia worked with. But they are going to maintain significant military and economic influence. So essentially, yeah, you're still not really independent because um, you can't choose to spend your money how you want and all of your major um industries are going to be controlled by the British. As far as Palestine goes, well, you have this dual promise, right? The promise of the Balfour Declaration that, yeah, Palestine can be a Jewish state. And then the promises made to the Arab peoples being like, yeah, you can rule yourself. But the Balfour Declaration set forth a huge wave of Jewish immigration from Europe to Palestine. And this is going to upset the people who already live there, right? If you're an Arab already living there, you're going to view this as just colonialism, right? You have Europeans who moved to the Americas and displaced and killed the native peoples living there. They did it in Canada. They did it in Australia. They did it in New Zealand. They did it in Argentina. How is this any different, right? That's how it's going to feel to the Arabs. So the British will try to limit the Jewish immigration, and instead, all they manage to do is alienate, piss off, both the Jews and the Arabs. All right, what about Egypt? Well, Egypt will um, be pseudo-independent, right? So the British had occupied Egypt as a protectorate ever since the Orabi Revolt. But in the early 1900s, you have dissent. Right? The Egyptians are not okay with this. So nationalist parties are forming, frustrated with British monopolies and corruption. And then in 1906, we have the Din Shoei incident. Essentially, British officers upset the residents of the city of, or village of Din Shoei by hunting pigeons for sport. Now you might think, what's the big deal? But these pigeons were specifically raised 
by the villagers as a source of income. And these British officers were just drunk and shot all the pigeons just for fun because they thought it'd be funny to do while they were wasted. Now remember, in Islam, you're not supposed to drink. So the fact that they were drunk anyway is kind of offensive and then they destroy your entire local economy. The um, villagers try to stop these drunk officers, you know, hey, stop destroying our stuff. In the same way, imagine if, um, imagine if a bunch of army officers tried to destroy your farm, right? That would be upsetting, especially if they were doing it just for fun. So they try and stop the officers. A fight breaks out. A officer's gun is fired unintentionally. Quotation marks around that unintentionally and this gun by shot wounds the wife of the local imam this enrages the villagers who attack right one officer runs away and ends up dying of heat stroke yeah man because you can't get drunk in the desert and then run away without water or shade anyone knows that a villager who approached him to help was found with the body um and so the Brits assumed that he had killed the officer, right? So this is a farce to begin with. One, the Brits are in the wrong every step of the way. Two, a kind Egyptian who goes after the guy to try and help him finds his dead body, is found by other Brits with the dead body, and they just assume, yeah, you must have killed this guy, even though he very obviously died of heat stroke. Yeah, this Egyptian controlled the sun, sure. So... The villagers are arrested. They are put on trial. Some are sentenced to death for killing the officer. Others were giving life sentences and others flogged. Right, this just reveals British arrogance in an already tense relationship. They can just do whatever they want and get away with it. It's going to lead to heightened Egyptian nationalism because anyone who thought, oh, maybe it's not that bad, just thought, just realize, no, it is that bad. So, in 1913, the British will give Egypt representation in the British Parliament. But in 1914, World War I begins and the Brits are distracted. Right? So, in 1919, we have the Egyptian Revolution. During World War I, the Brits used the Suez Canal and other critical resources, aka cotton, from Egypt. Egyptians demanded representatives at the Paris Peace Conference and were denied, right? And so in 1919, you have a revolution against British occupation of Egypt and the Sudan. The Brits realized this might be more trouble than it's worth, and so they recognized Egyptian independence and the British began to withdraw in 1922. This revolution is led by the Watts party, the Nationalist Liberal Party, but the British will keep them from any exercising any real power. The new constitution will change Egypt from a dynastic rule of Khedives to a parliamentary monarchy that is nationally elected. And the British continue to um, control the Suez Canal um, until 1936, which is kind of like the most important part that Egypt has to offer economically. So before we jump into that, um, last couple thoughts. So even though Egypt is independent, they now see that their politicians are more concerned with power and wealth than poverty aid, education, health, and labor. And the king, King Farouk, is going to still remain under the influence and the thumb of the British into the 20th century, right? And really until we get um, General Sadat. So nationalism in the Middle East. After, ooh, conclusion here. After World War I, Ottoman Empire collapses. You have the formation of an independent Turkey. With the League of Nations, Britain and France divided up the Arab portions of the Ottoman Empire, despite European promises to after um, World War I. So France gets Syria and Lebanon, Britain gets Iraq, Palestine, and um, Transjordan. Nationalism grows in all of these locations. 
Palestine and a Jewish Holy Land? Question mark. Well, the 1894 Dreyfus Affair in France spurs Jewish Zionists, right? The movement uh, for a Jewish Middle Eastern Holy Land. The Dreyfus Affair is a farce, um, essentially a um, French officer, Dreyfus, is accused of being a, tre- um, a traitor, but it turns out th- he was just accused because he was Jewish and reveals tons of anti- uh, anti-Semitism in Europe. The 1917 Balfour Declaration aggravated relationships between Palestinian Arabs and the English. So ask yourself, what did the Din Shoy incident reveal about British-Egyptian relations and describe the Dreyfus Affair? So, a little bit of thinking forward before our next lecture. When you think of the 1920s, what comes to mind? And then your summary for the day. Explain the continuities and changes in territorial holdings from 1900 to the present. Do this for both Asia and the Middle East. As always, guys, there are videos available on our YouTube playlist in Unit 7. Um, There are more videos there than I ever include in these lectures. I recommend you check them out. Um, Make sure you're reading your textbook and um, make sure you are asking questions if you have them. It's important that you understand these concepts. All right. Thanks for listening.